The context for sustainable urban design is so rich and so diverse, I'd be hard-pressed to choose what to show and where to begin, but a snapshot of a few visions for cities post-industrial revolution and some future city concepts for sustainability will manage to put sustainable urban design in perspective. I'm going to start with the Garden City, which is really a movement, the Garden City movement. In a very simplified summary, as the Industrial Revolution took place, people used to walk to work. That was the main form of daily commute, and so the pollution from the manufacturing industries made their way to their homes where they lived because the homes were walking distance away from work. This called for a new form of city. The image here shows one of Ebenezer Howard's Garden City design plans, showing a garden city at the center, surrounded by agricultural land and connected to other garden cities by roads and railway lines. So an idea was initiated in 1898 by Sir Ebenezer Howard in the United Kingdom, which he referred to as the Garden City Movement, and it is a method of urban planning where self-contained com communities of people are surrounded by green belts and aims to separate housing from industry and from agriculture. In his book, Garden Cities of Tomorrow, published in 1902, Howard laid out his visions for this utopian garden city. He envisioned that garden cities would be home to 32,000 people on a site that is 2,400 hectares, which contains 5,000 acres of agricultural land and 1,000 acres for the city, that's 6,000 acres in total and is planned in a concentric pattern with open spaces and six radial boulevards extending from the center. When the Garden City would reach its population capacity, another Garden City would be developed nearby, and in this way there would be clusters of Garden Cities around a central city, linked by road and a rail. His vision provided the working class an opportunity to work in industries without having to live in polluted or crowded spaces which seems great, but this also brought about some problems, including access to industries, trains were now used to take people to and from work, adding to the levels of pollution, and the separation of residential from industrial land uses brought about the challenges with the zoning practices we see today. This image here shows a housing development in Canberra in Australia. Notice the garden city-like urban design. You can see the borders of a self-contained city and radial access to other areas. Another icon worth mentioning is Le Corbusier, who lived between 1887 and 1965, was a Swiss-French architect and urban planner, and is considered one of the pioneers of what is now known as modern architecture. His career spans five decades, where he designed many buildings around the world and contributed to architecture and town planning globally. One of his goals was to improve the life of people living in crowded cities. In 1922, Le Corbusier presented a model of La Ville Contemporaine, contemporary city, another utopian model for a city for three million people. The model was submitted as an entry to the Salon d'Automne in, Par in Paris, the annual art exhibit. The image here is a drawing of his design entry that included a group of 60-story skyscrapers built on steel frames and with glass walls. These tall buildings were set within large areas of green space, and at the center of the city plan was a transportation hub for buses and trains, as well as a large highway and even an airport. He had a vision that people would travel in planes, which are capable of landing between the skyscrapers. Though creating a dense urban center was capable of housing larger populations of people, the adverse implications of this design was that it segregated pedestrian traffic from car traffic, which glorified the use of the automobiles as the main means of transportation. This is a photo of the Greater Toronto Area and Highway 401 running across the city. Doesn't it look familiar to Le Corbusier's contemporary city with the tall buildings and the highway cutting through? This architect's model of the contemporary city, shown here in the image, follows some fundamental principles around decongestion of the centers of cities, increased housing density, enlargement of the means of circulation of traffic, and enlargement of the landscaped area. The image here of Hong Kong's buildings in the middle of green space in the distance looks quite familiar to the contemporary city. Today, 
How have cities been designed to accommodate populations of not only 3 million people, like that of Le Corbusier, but 6 million people, like the greater Toronto area, or even 10 million pe people or more, as in the size of megacities? High-rises seem to be a prevalent solution. Taking the greater Toronto area, for example, housing density, according uh, to the research by Norman et al., suggests that when looking at a life cycle analysis, high density housing accounts for less emissions attributable to transportation, building operations, and building materials. The chart here shows two bar graphs, where low density housing is on the left and high density housing is on the right, divided into transportation emissions in yellow, building operations emissions in orange, and building materials in blue. The y-axis is a measure of greenhouse gas emissions in kilograms of CO2 equivalents per year. The total emissions from low-density housing is 8,640 kilograms of CO2 annually, and from high-density housing, that number is almost two and a half times smaller at 3,340 kilograms of CO2. And how are cities designed to accommodate the growth and traffic that inevitably accompanies the growth in cities? The image here of a congested road in Bangkok shows different forms of travel modes. There's buses, cars, motorcycles, bicycles, scooters, and pedestrians. Will there be more highways for cars or more roads for bicycles or more innovations in public transit? Future city designs are plentiful. They don't necessarily need to look like futuristic cities in science fiction, though some indeed do look like that. But they may be designed as model cities, such as Mazdar City in the United Arab Emirates, shown here, that runs on 100% renewable energy and could be replicated around the world. Or they could be city redesigns that happen gradually over time. This particular set of images here are from the University of Toronto's landmark project, which is designed to follow the principles of promoting pedestrianism, cycling, green space, natural features, and community spaces. A very similar effort a few years back took place to transform Harvard Yard in Cambridge, Massachusetts in a similar manner. Urban designs have been the subject of many design competitions. From the proposals for the International Competition of Sustainable Urban Systems Design, a report of the International Gas Union Special Project at the 22nd World Gas Conference in Tokyo in 2003, presented a number of interesting competition entries. The competition required the submissions from international combined design and energy teams to propose integrated models for urban environments to become more sustainable, taking the energy supply as a major starting point in their thinking. In the aftermath of the competition, a follow-up project arose which emphasized collaboration rather than competition in developing sustainable solutions for energy-conscious regions. In this Bridging to the Future project, teams from Canada, India, China, United States, and the Netherlands took up the challenge, and the following are quick overviews of three of the entries. In the United States, a sustainable urban design for San Diego and California focused on sustainable energy systems to include microgrids that support energy flows within urban villages and neighborhoods, resource management centers, and energy production technologies. Another focus was sustainable urban water supply powered by energy from methane and hydrogen converted old underground parking structures into stormwater cisterns. In Canada, a sustainable urban design for the city of Vancouver in British Columbia came up with eight catalyst strategies which are reflected in the need to protect and connect ribbons of blue and green, design multi-use spaces and convertible structures, plan short loops and integrated infrastructure networks, become net contributors, experiment and learn, enhance the diversity of choices, create shock-resilient cells, and green and clean the import-export chains. And in India, a sustainable urban design for Goa developed communities along a spine where living urban nuclei are at the heart of each community and where the static spine contains subterranean service tunnels and the dynamic body is residential housing that can swell and shrink in response to changing populations and economic needs. The images show the city design drawing and a rendering in addition to a cross-section of the city along the spine.
With so much to consider when designing cities, there are so many questions on what defines sustainable urban design. Like, what is urban design? How is it different from architecture? Is it interdisciplinary? And why? Are there other teachings necessary to understand urban design? What are urban design considerations? Amongst so many others. The infrastructure that is built in cities will last longer than our lifetimes, and much of the infrastructure that is required in the future has not been built yet. So it is important to think carefully about urban design and design it for sustainability. We don't have all the answers, but many urban planners and theorists have some ideas on urban design. There are many names listed here. What we will go through are the ones highlighted in red, which include, in alphabetical order, Peter Buccini, Jane Jacobs, Kevin Lynch, Franz Oswald, John Todd, Nancy Todd, and Vanessa Watson. 